It once held the title of the world's tallest building. A little more than half a century later, it was just a memory in the New York City skyline. Today, Two Minute Architecture Time Machine winds back the clock to explore the rise and fall of the Singer Tower. Downtown New York City has always been home to some of the world's most beautiful art deco and gothic architectural designs, with some of these buildings reaching the status of world's tallest long before the Midtown skyscraper boom. Some notables on this list include the World Building, built in 1894, reaching a height of 309 feet, 20 stories, and was demolished in 1955. The Manhattan Life Insurance Building, which opened in 1899 with 18 floors, reaching a height of 348 feet. It was demolished in 1964. The Park Row Building, standing in at 30 stories and 391 feet. It was opened in 1908 and is happily still standing today as a converted residential structure. Which brings us to the subject of today's video, the Singer Tower. When completed in 1908, it became the world's tallest building, topping out at 674 feet and 40 stories tall. Its presence in the lower Manhattan skyline came to an end when it was demolished in 1968. I'm Tai Chi, and today's story starts in 1851 when inventor Isaac M. Singer and lawyer Edward C. Clark established I.M. Singer & Company, later renamed the Senior Manufacturing Company in 1865, and finally renamed the Singer Company in 1963. Singer's designs for the sewing machine made them practical for everyday domestic use. His machines made use of the lock stitch developed by Elias Howe, the father of the modern sewing machine. After a patent infringement suit that fell in favor of Howe, Singer was granted his own patent for improvements he made that included a circular feed wheel and a thread controller. By 1860, Singer had collected enough patents to move his sewing machines into production, and in 1863, built the sprawling factory complex in Elizabeth, New Jersey. The factory at its peak had 10,000 employees and served as a pillar of civic pride in the community. Generations of Singer families would enjoy employment that would provide long-term security and a decent working class salary. Financial success was fueled by Singer's marketing plan, which included ads that encouraged sewing as an activity that could be shared between a mother and daughter. The company also introduced easy payment plans that would fit into almost any budget. By 1906, the decision was made by the Singer Company's fifth president, Frederick Gilbert Bourne, to renovate and expand Singer's New York City headquarters located at 149 Broadway. The original structure was made up of the 10-story Singer Building built between 1897 and 1898 and the 14-story Bourne Building built adjacent to it between 1898 and 1899. Bourne commissioned architect Ernest Flagg to design a tower that would rise 674 feet above street level, 200 feet taller than the nearby Park Row Building and 100 feet higher than most of the famous spires of Europe. The tower, that would be the world's tallest building, would be designed in the Beaux Arts style it would be clad in dark red face bricks, North River bluestone, and detailed in lavish terracotta. Word of these lofty plans quickly reached the newspapers. In an article dated July 22, 1906, the New York Daily Tribune wrote the following in an article titled, Vast Sums, Vast Piles. The Singer Building is to be the one that the visitor to New York would go to see on its first day in town. The New York Times added, with the exception of the Eiffel Tower, it will be the loftiest structure in the world. But not everyone was impressed. Alfred Jansen Bloor, architect and secretary of the American Institute of Architecture, warned in the Architects Builders magazine, calamity is also in store for the public, and later wrote to the editor of the New York Tribune, adding, firemen are afraid of the skyscraper. They have good reason to be. On August 28, 1906, the Foundation Company started work that would continue both night and day to complete the foundation by March 1st of 1907. This work was hampered by the relatively small area of the site in respect to the space required to construct the 30 caissons necessary to build the below-ground concrete piers that would eventually support the tower. Inside that small space, there needed to be room for hoisting equipment, delivery platforms, and bracing to support the existing building while constructing the foundation. The top of each concrete pier was capped with a vertical steel anchorage. Ten of these piers had their anchorages extended all the way to the bottom of their respective pier. 
These were utilized to take advantage of the full weight of the pier to help support the tower in high winds. Not long after the foundation was completed, the steel framework of the tower began to rise above street level. Construction would take two years to complete, and New Yorkers took great interest as the tower reached skyward. In 1907, the New York Tribune wrote, the tower of the Singer Building will have 41 floors containing offices and will be 13 stories higher than any other structure now standing in the city. Even before construction was completed, the Singer Building gained international attention. On August 29, 1907, Prince Wilhelm of Sweden was taken to the 29th floor. The prince stayed for half an hour taking in the view. It is simply magnificent, he told reporters. Beyond all doubt, it is the grandest sight I have ever beheld in my life. The prince was especially interested in visiting the rising skyscraper because most of the iron workers were Swedish born. He was told by the engineer that probably on account of their early training on ship mast and other high places, Swedes were found to be the safest men on the tail jobs of any of the nationalities which work on them. The top of the tower contained a 50-foot tall dome cat by lantern that measures 9 feet across at its base and stretches 63 feet tall. The top of the lantern was 612 feet above ground level and a steel flagpole rose 62 feet above the lantern bringing the total height of the Singer Tower to 674 feet. The flagpole was actually 90 feet long but the base of the flagpole was mounted in a steel socket at the lowermost floor of the lantern. On October 11, 1907, all eyes were on a man at the top of the flagpole. The New York Tribune reported, The highest point above the sidewalk ever attained by a man outside a balloon in New York was reached yesterday by Ernest Capel, steeplejack who placed a golden ball on the top of the flagpole that surmounts the Singer Building in Lower Broadway. Prior to going up the flagpole, Capel dismissed questions of fear. Afraid? Why, it's no better or worse to fall off a little country church steeple than it is to fall off this pole. When the Singer Tower was completed in 1908, the newspapers scrambled to print lists of staggering statistical facts. The Sun reported on June 28th, it contains 136 miles of various kinds of metal piping. The telephones, elevators, electric lights, fans, and clocks required 3,425 miles of wire, which if extended out, they would extend from the top of the Singer Building to the top of the Eiffel Tower in Paris with 300 miles left over. The steel used in the construction of the Singer Building, if made into three quarter inch cable wire, would reach from New York to Buenos Aires, a distance of 7,100 miles. The total length of the steel bearing columns of the building is about 10 miles. The terracotta floor blocks in the building, if spread out on a plane, would cover 8.96 acres. If placed end to end, they would extend 97 miles or further than New York to Philadelphia. So what happened to the Singer Tower? By the 1960s, the age of the sewing machine had begun to pass and Singer downsized and relocated to office space at Rockefeller Center. According to property records, Iacoban Rose bought the building and immediately sold it to Financial Place Incorporated. Real estate developer William Zeckendorf acquired the building and sought unsuccessfully for the New York Stock Exchange to move there. In 1964, United States still acquired the Singer Building along with the neighboring City Investment Building and had plans to demolish the entire block to erect its new 54-story headquarters on the same site. Unfortunately, the Singer Tower's small floor plates, which were only 4,200 square feet, were not conducive to modern office layouts. By comparison, the building that would replace it had a floor plate size of 37,000 square feet, almost nine times larger. Efforts were made to save the Singer Tower, the newly created New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission in 1965 made an effort to save the building in the wake of several notable buildings in the city having either been demolished or threatened with demolition. Although the Singer Building was considered to be one of the most iconic buildings in New York City, it did not receive landmark designation which would have saved it from being torn down. The New York Daily News observed, the Singer fell victim to a malady called progress. The wrecking ball started swinging in August of 1967 and the building was mere rubble the following year. 
It remained the tallest building ever voluntarily demolished in the world until the demolition of 270 Park Avenue, initially known as the Union Carbine Building, in 2021. On the subject of the demolition, the New York Times wrote in part, high above the intersection of Broadway and Liberty Street, a demolition torch blazed against a hazy sky as a steel worker cut into a beam on the tallest building ever to be demolished. Passers-by below paused to gaze up at the structure which many, especially the younger among them, had ignored until the demolition workers began attacking it. When it was completed 60 years ago, the Singer Building was the world's tallest building. It was held as a wonder of its day, as a soaring dominance on the Manhattan skyline that pointed the way to the architectural future. And now, some bonus facts. The executive offices of the Singer Tower covered the entire 34th floor. There were original oriental rugs, custom-designed empire-inspired mahogany furniture, and carved woodwork. It was said that such furniture appeals to the discriminating man and creates the right impression upon all who see it. The Safe Deposit Company of New York took about 10,000 square feet in the basement of the new building, signing a 20-year lease. The term basement, however, may have been misleading. Ornate columns and arch vaults upheld a series of domes in the cathedral-like space. The idea was to offer its patrons the most secure, elaborate, and convenient means for the safekeeping of their valuables. The power source for the steam plant was converted from coal to oil in 1921, making the Singer Building the city's first office building to use oil as a fuel. The observation tower opened on the 42nd floor on July 1, 1908. Never before had New Yorkers seen the city from so lofty a perch. The Evening World remarked, it gives a sightseeing radius of 30 miles in all directions, and being the highest observation tower in the world, it affords a view never before possible except from an airship. The Singer Tower was not without a dark past. In the building's first few months, the elevators were involved in at least two deaths. A painter was decapitated on May 4, 1908, while a plumber's assistant was crushed between an elevator cab and a shaft on July 24th of the same year. Not all deaths were accidental. Unfortunately, extremely tall buildings not only offer stunning views, they also offer a convenient means of suicide. Albert Goodman, an agent for the Mutual Life Insurance Company, was one of the early victims. On August 10, 1916, police headquarters received a letter from Goldman. The writer said he had decided to end his life by jumping from some hot building downtown and begged the police commissioner to forgive any annoyance might, that might be caused by his act. Goldman ended his life by jumping from the 42nd floor observation deck. His body struck the mansard roof on the 13th floor and landed across Broadway on the sidewalk in front of McHugh Brothers and Drummond opposite the entrance of the Singer Building. It was not the observation platform that served as a jumping point for Austin Adams Jr. The 59-year-old wheelbarrow manufacturer visited his attorney at the offices of Douglas Moore and Grover C. Sniffen regarding business matters on October 15, 1930. The firm had its offices on the 24th floor. When Adams arrived, Moore was out of the office, so according to the New York Times, he put aside his coat, hat, and umbrella and began reading a magazine to wait for his lawyer. But Sniffen, who was sitting at a desk in the same room, walked out for a few moments. He returned to find Adams missing. The man had thrown himself out of the office window, falling to his death on the 14th floor setback. The police said that Adams was apparently depressed over business difficulties. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and let me know in the comments if you've ever been to the Singer Tower yourself or knew someone who worked there. I'd love to hear your stories. Also, let me know if there's any other lost buildings in New York you'd like me to cover in another video. Till then, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next episode.